the first question is, are drug-induced altered states as valid as altered states that are not drug-induced? And <laughs> what value do drug states have? Well, I obviously must start out before this discussion with a disclaimer that I do not advocate the violent overthrow of the government. <laughs> 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 Nonviolence is a whole other matter. Uh, I do, I do think uh, laws aren't very conscious, but I uh, want to say that I can't advocate the breaking of a law. You must do what you do. Um, I have found psychedelics a very uh, significant and important and useful part of my spiritual practice more so many years ago than now, um, although even in recent years it has been slightly useful. Um, initially for me, psychedelics was a, was a, a really radical way of breaking through some very powerful mindsets or habits of thought. And it opened me to a deeper truth of my being. And I, I can't speculate because it's a hypothetical question that I can't deal with because I don't know. But I can see my colleagues at Harvard and who I was, we were very simpatico in my old form. And I meet them now and we have very little business together. They are living in a different world than I am. And I really feel that the root of that shift for me was uh, due to psychedelics. So I honor them and I would n never be a hypocrite to deny that, even though there's a lot of social pressure on me often to do that. Um, however, what was necessary in 1960, one, is not necessarily necessary now, because what I have noticed is that some of the breakthroughs from the kind of reality that was so absolute in when I was growing up, those breakthroughs through the rock music and through a whole variety of vehicles, probably stimulated in large part by psychedelics in the United States anyway, um, that has become, that has mainstreamed. Those shifts in perspective are much more available to somebody without chemicals now than they were in the time that I first ingested psilocybin. That um, I talk in the Midwest, for example, and may give a lecture and the audience, I would say that at least 70 or more percent of them have never smoked pot or taken any psychedelic. And most of them have never read any Eastern books or been to the East. And I say the same things I was saying in 1960, which a small group of people could, could hear. And I find that mainstream America, almost, not quite. I mean, still, it's a selective group that comes to hear Ramdas, but it's in Iowa. Uh, and they are all going like this. And they're hearing it. And they're hearing it because the, the zeitgeist has changed. The cultural milieu about realities has shifted, just like why channels and all of those things are much more accessible into the society. The possibility that there are other realms of reality is more available. I mean, it used to be that when I was in the United States, because of the overriding power of the main church of America, which was science, which was based on a physics model, a natural science model, that anything about altered states of consciousness was treated as very aberrant. And I would go to England and I would find an entirely different milieu there. They had had years and years of being able to absorb the idea of other planes of reality. And they had occultists and all that were part of the society. They were no longer. And when you look at why there are gurus in India, part of it is that the society supports 
that quality of cultivation of spirit in people. And it acknowledges it while we put those people in mental hospitals for the most part. Because they are aberrant from a mainstream consciousness. So um, we have had some basic shifts which make psychedelics somewhat less of a necessity for breaking through than they used to be. I meet many, I work with kids now and many of them have never had any psychedelics and I don't find that there is a great bridge in our consciousness. They can hear what I have learned through all these experiences and they can hear it and they can hear it in a way that is useful for them to hear it. So I want to say that at the outset. I next want to say that um, that um, the governmental legislative structures regarding uh, chemicals is so um, insensitive to the differences between what they mass as drugs, the differences between uh, the tryptamines or psychedelics on one hand and the opiates on the other, and those are all classed as drugs, so that morphine and LSD are considered drugs, and they're considered bad because they are socially injurious to the ongoing structure of society. Now, that's a very interesting social political question of how, in a healthy society, how much it can allow for that which would change itself, and how much it punishes anything that would change it because, and if the fear count is very high in a society, it becomes very rigid in its boundaries of rejecting anything through which it would grow itself, and it keeps stifling itself because it can't allow those pseudopods of growth to happen, especially when they're powerful, because from a society's point of view, they are chaotic. Now, what's happening in our society, I mean, let me just jump politically for a moment, is that you have an increasing economic polarization in the society, and you have lower windows of opportunity for a larger segment of the population and there's not as much e equality of poverty as Dr. V was talking about. Everybody in the village, Dr. V said, was poor. And so everybody understood and they shared what they had. As you get these incredible differentials of uh, King of the Mountain, what you have is the opportunity, the opportunity for a way of drug use as first an economic New, other, other power system to come in to counteract a, a structure that is not giving people opportunity. So that the, the black market drug culture has become another economic structure other than nationalism, for example. It's like multinationals now. The other thing is it also provides the drug experience is used very heavily for escapism, meaning it's used to push away what is an unpleasant set of circumstances. So when you look at what the drug problems are in the culture, you see that you're dealing with uh, basic dissatisfactions, part of which are economically motivated in inner city people who don't have a window of opportunity. I mean, if you can make 500 bucks a day selling crack, you're going to do it much more readily than you're going to go to school and work at McDonald's for three bucks an hour, three and a half bucks an hour. Uh, for a future that is really kind of iffy anyway because you're black or whatever, uh, or some minority group. So, um, and, but the interesting thing is the movement of cocaine primarily, and now some crack, but mostly cocaine into the middle class Caucasian population. And that represents a deeper dissatisfaction with the myths of the culture that the that the break of the family that Dr. V has been talking about and a whole lot of factors of where the myth that when people make it, when they do everything the society said, if you do this, you'll be happy, and they do it and then they're not happy, then they are open to the use of the drugs as a vehicle to escape from the fact that they played the game as well as they could because the society is basically an externalized society. It's basically saying you will be happy if you have a speedboat, or you'll be happy if you have a second home, or you'll be happy if you have some material thing. And basically that's a quick rush, but it's not happiness. It's pleasure, but not happiness. And what we the society's been selling is pleasure, not happiness. And that discrepancy is part of the root cause of the, the use of drugs as escapism. Now, 
what the society is afraid of are two things. One is that if too many people use escapist things, first it builds another economic structure, which undercuts the whole economic structure of the society. I mean, this is all, none of it's taxable. <laughs> because of the society's naivete, again, instead of making it taxable, which they could. The, set, the other part of it is that um, uh, the society is afraid that what drugs do is undermine the verticality of power structures. That when you take psychedelics, for example, or most drugs, you look at social institutions and you see that they are rather flimsy constructions of the human intellect. And, I mean, I've gone on LSD through Washington and looked at the Pentagon and it just looked like this huge little creation of fear of a group of t teenagers. <laughs> I mean, that's roughly what it looked like. I mean, the whole... All these institutions that are made, the mint and all, they're made to the Treasury Department, made to look like you're supposed to look like this. And, you know, like, they're, they're, not, they're, not, uh, they're not pilgrimage sites in the sense of worship, although people do tours to see the power of the government. But you can feel that that power is rooted in fear. And when you see that, it undercuts that power. And why the drugs in the early 60s undercut the power of the monolithic structures and the verticality of it such that the anti-Vietnam movement could get hold, for example. That was rooted in drugs. That was rooted in psychedelic openings. That wasn't just social consciousness that was like the social consciousness of the 40s and 50s. It was a different kind of thing. It was where the power of the power holders were in jeopardy. And Nixon sat in his White House and watched that scene out there and there was a handwriting on the wall that the power had been gone. And all the sexual freedom and women's rights and gay rights and all of the whole range of those things came out of that breakdown of the myths of the, the, the verticality of the system. So there is a fear in a society of those kinds of things, chemicals, that would alter the citizen's sense of their own power, really. And... We've, so there's that one, and there's the shift of the economic base. These are all basic s political social issues that are around the drug issue. It can't just be treated as good guys and bad guys, and drugs are evil. Because drugs are not evil. They are just another set of experiences. And somebody who is addicted, like Lee Iacocca, to more power and money, is as addicted, and, and he has as big a drug habit. And the person who has the need for continuous sex all the time and more and more conquests all the time, and which is keeping a whole set of industries operating all the time in terms of pornography and all of that stuff, that is just as sick an addiction as cocaine. And we're going to deal with that in the addiction group. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be cheating. Strike all that. I didn't say any of that. <laughs> so, um, see, we have a little problem with the structure, you see, because over, everything overlaps. Um, so when we come to the distinction, besides all of that has been the problem of the society that leads to drugs used as withdrawal or as avoidance, the other end of it is the sacramental use of chemicals in which chemicals can be used as instruments for regaining our own divinity. And it has been used historically for through culture after culture, for generation after generation. And we have now t legally thrown out the baby with the bath, in a sense, because we were so afraid of the dirty bathwater, we opened the thing and the baby went too, and the baby we needed. And uh, uh, so it has gone underground. And in a way, the, those forces in a society which would awaken people to the spiritual dimension, which diminishes the power of the state, of the individual, because you're serving a higher master, which is the same thing as uh, uh, Jesus's discussions with, um, uh, with Herod and with, you know, with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, the Roman forces and the Jewish elders and so on. In those times, it was the fact that he was serving another force that that made him willing to die, and and once they don't have the power of death, 
Do you see? That's the final power. If you don't do good, I'll take your life away. And you say, go ahead, baby. That's your karmic problem, not mine. And that really shakes the whole game. I mean, when enough people play, and that's exactly what Gandhi was teaching in nonviolence. In nonviolence. And that was the power of his movement. He was saying there was a higher force there. So, um, when we deal with the tryptamines, which are mind manifesting or allow you to set aside your habitual ways of looking at things for a moment in order to see freshly, to regain innocence, to see without the imposition of conceptual structure, it allows you to see how imprisoned you have been by a traditional structure of mind. And you get to the point where you can work with the structures of mind, which is your ego structure, really, or your structure of self. You can work with it without being entrapped in it. And that's what the psychedelics are about. And they, under the conditions where you have been doing your practice and you are either schooled in working with psychedelics or you have good guides or you have good friends that you trust in a good setting, these can be useful to remind you. Maharaji said, he said, if you're in a cool, he said to me, if you're in a cool place and you're feeling much peace and your mind is turned towards God, it could be useful. See, that's the sacramental use. He said, it would allow you to come in and have the darshan of Christ. I mean, you could be in the presence of spirit. He said, you can only stay two hours because it's not the real thing, the real samadhi, but it's useful. And I really hear that, just that way. I don't hear it as the final method, but I hear it as a reminder to reawaken you once again. And I've used it that way. I've taken LSD maybe once every couple of years. Uh, under which circumstances and to what extent uh, can psychedelics be an enhancer of the uh, process, process of the evolution of consciousness? And what are the risks? And what are, what? What are the risks? in using risks. psychedelics for this. When is it appropriate to use psychedelics and what are the risks? Uh, for those of you that have just joined us, I know some new people have arrived. <laughs> and this is an interesting question to start off with. Um, and some of you might not even know what psychedelics are. So let me start more generally. Um, Way, since ancient times, there has been known even probably the Eleusinian mysteries in the West and uh, uh, the idea of the con of the 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 elixir called soma in the East. There has been um, reports of the use of um, various natural herbs and medicines that are used in rituals for um, religious, um, for uh, religious transformation experiences, for initiations. And um, usually the initiate is very well prepared for this with um, fasting, with study, with um, a ritual in which they are led through it by a guide or a priest. In, uh, in Spanish, in the Mexico, for example, it's called a corandero. And um, some of these uh, chemicals, for example, are found in mushrooms, certain mushrooms. Uh, one of them is called in Spanish, Tiananoctal, or flesh of the gods. And it is used um, in some countries for um, to allow a medicine man to do medicine person to do healing, or allow them to have oracular powers to see beyond or see more deeply into or understand more about the universe or about another person. Um, so there's a very ancient history about the use of such chemicals. Um, in recent times, starting in, uh, it really goes back a long time, but um, 
um, in the recent experiences, uh, back in the 40s in France, um, and then in Mexico and a number of places, there started to be renewed interest in this by Western scientists and uh, by botanists to understand how these chemicals work on the mind. And um, in Switzerland, in uh, Basel, Switzerland, a man by the name of Albert Hoffman, who was the head of research for the Sandoz Pharmaceutical Company, was working with some chemicals that um, were to be used for um, in relation to um, women's menstrual cycles and pregnancy. And um, he, um, he got some of the chemical, a very tiny amount of this chemical. He was working with ergot, which is a, uh, it comes from a mold that grows on rye wheat. And he got a very tiny amount of this on his uh, fingers. And whether it got to his mouth or his nostrils or just went in through his fingers. And he began to feel very strange. He didn't associate it with what he got on his fingers, but he felt very strange. And he went home to bed. And then he began to think of the relationship between these things. And so the next day he tried some more of it. And he... Uh, realized that what he had come across was a chemical that profoundly altered his consciousness. Now, um, that started a... Uh, already, people had pri previously in the West been using um, peyote, which is a cactus, a bud from a cactus, and been using um, um, the mushrooms. And now, with the ergot, the LSD, which was called LSD-25, which was a much more powerful one than either of those other chemical substances. Okay, that's the history. Um, the effect of those chemicals, although it isn't precisely known, it appears to work on the um, synapses of the nerve fibers, where the nerve fibers meet, which is usually coded. Uh, it's encoded that we learn a coding. We, we train our nerve fibers, if you will, into habits of thought so that when, a, when I hold this up, you see hand, for example, and you say hand. And that association, when you were a baby and I held this up, you didn't see hand. You just saw light and dark, and then you learn the term hand or whatever language you learned it in, and then when I hold this up, you see that and as if you see hand immediately. But actually, that's a whole encoding of your brain that does that, and it happens extremely fast. I'm like, are you hearing this all? So, um, what this chemical seemed to do was that it seemed to override those codes to allow you to look freshly at the universe with the same innocence that a baby might look at it and begin and then as the chemical wore off and you came back into your how it didn't destroy the habits it just set them aside for the moment it overrode them and as those habits came back in you would begin to see the way you were if you will you would see the structure of your ego or the structure of your mind's way of defining the universe because there are there are there is an immense amount of stimulation any moment and what you choose to see is only a tiny fragment of what's available in the universe and that's efficient for survival but it also makes you walking a very narrow path through reality. It's not, and you keep beginning to see, as you come back into your normal waking consciousness, you see the way in which your mind is defining your reality. Like you and I are each walking through an entirely different universe. I mean, if you had, for example, a good father figure, when you see a man, you have one reaction. If you had a bad father figure and you see a man, you have another reaction. If you were 
uh, scared by a dog as a child, when the dog comes towards you, you have one reaction. If you were not, if you always had a puppy when you were a baby and you played with it and a dog comes towards you, you have another reaction. These are learned responses based on your habits and your history. And so for somebody who's afraid of dogs, you just assume everybody's afraid of dogs because you've never known not to be afraid of dogs. For somebody that isn't, you can't even understand somebody that might be. So in a way, this was a great leveler. It allowed people to come out of their egocentric predicament for a moment and see the universe freshly. And the predicament is that as you develop a model of who you are and how the universe works, it's extremely hard to get out of that, and it, which is called the ego, really. It's very hard to get out of that. And what the chemical allows you to do is set that aside for a moment and see the universe from a different vantage point and find places in yourself which is why it was used in religious traditions, find the deeper parts of your being that lie behind your thinking mind. Now, hear clearly that when those chemicals were used historically, they were used in ritual and they were used sacramentally. They were used as a sacrament. One of the things that happens is that the way we live life, we have muted our senses a great deal in order to not overwhelm, be overwhelmed by stimulation. There is so much stimulation available, our ears, our eyes, our nose, our skin, it's all receiving. And because it is so much, we, our minds start to rule down so we don't notice a lot of stuff. We just don't notice anything. For example, at this moment, if I just say to you, feel the sensations in your left elbow. Now, don't move your elbow. Just feel it. Feel your left elbow. See the subtle sensations it's sending to your nervous system, to your brain. It's just the fibers, the nerve fibers at the end of the elbow are being constantly affected by the tiny chemical changes that are occurring at the tip of the nerve fibers that are happening from the wind or the air or very subtle things. And so there is sensation there. And that's happening from everywhere in your body and your auditory nerves and your, no your olfactory and your taste buds. They're all firing and doing all this stuff all the time. But most of the time, until I mentioned your left elbow, probably none of you were thinking of your left elbow. The minute I mentioned it, you could not not think about it. And so the question is, how do you deal when you're in a sea of information all the time? And what the mind does is it just ignores 99% of it to take the information that it feels is necessary for the next action. And that would be wonderful if you could turn off that monitoring system at some time and go back to the full freshness. But the problem is that you've learned efficiency at the cost that you can't turn it off. And the thinking mind starts to rule you. The efficiency starts to determine how you can see the universe. Is this clear? Now, um, so what the chemicals allowed you to do was to step aside from that and get a fresh look, if you will, at the universe. Now, but it also intensified sensation immensely. So if you were listening to music, instead of hearing it very thinly, it started to take on a richness. In fact, it was so rich that when you were listening to music, it would affect, it would cross sense, sense areas, and so you would see the music as well as hearing it. If you were looking at a painting, you would hear the painting as well as seeing it. In other words, it would stimulate across sense domains, which we don't allow with our usual mind. We have it narrowed down so you think and you see and you smell and you taste. And uh, when these boundaries break down, you begin to see the interrelatedness of everything in the universe. You see the way in which it all is connected with what you start to see the, 
the mystery that lies behind the apparent phenomena of the universe. Well, what happened was that um, these things were immediately attractive. When they started to enter into the Western culture in recent times, they started, they came in through, as I say, historically through religious ritual. But in modern times, they started to be used by, um, by artists, by musicians, because they intensified and enhanced and made fresh the nature of sound and visual information and gave them uh, tremendous creative breakthroughs in the way they saw things. And if you study the history of artists, you will find that through many techniques, they altered their chemistry chemically in order to shift their perceptual field. I mean, the history of drunkenness among the great artists is well known. I mean, uh, many of them died from very heavy alcohol use, from liver failure. Um, the use of um, hashish, the use of opium, uh, the use of any number of these chemicals which alter consciousness was used. Uh, jazz musicians are well known for their use of chemicals in order to free up their inhibitions and also allow them to feel, enter into the sensory domain in a different way. So now you have a different use of it. Not only do you have the use of it as a religious sacrament for plumbing the depths of the mystery of, of existence, but you now also have it for creative action, for increasing sensory and aesthetic experience. Now you also have it, you add on to that, the appreciation of aesthetics. So now somebody that's listening to music alters their consciousness to hear the music more fully, not to create it, but to hear it. So now you've got a third category. Okay. And you can see what's happening in society when you have that, that people, once it breaks out of the religious mold and the sacramental mode and moves into the aesthetic, uh, the creative mode, that's another group of population using it. And then once it moves from that into the aesthetic appreciation mode, it moves into another population, subpopulation, to intensify sensory experiences. Well, the chemicals move from being uh, very esoteric to being much more of a street phenomenon and started to be used extensively in the 60s by... Um, young people to enhance and intensify their sensory experiences. The added predicament with this, is this too long-winded or can you? The added predicament with this was that if you have a society that is based upon a um, a set of social institutions for keeping the society organized, keeping it orga from chaos. And there is a structure, there are in social institutions that have a vertical power structure. If you take these chemicals, what happens is the way you were trained, the way you were socialized as a child was that here were these very powerful beings called parents, and you are very little, and you were trained to believe in authority. They know what's best. The predicament when you take these chemicals is that you experience an inner validity to your own intuitive. You get in touch with your own intuitive voice which feels to you as valid and powerful as anything you hear from external to yourself. And you begin to trust what you feel inside, and therefore you raise questions about the external social institutions. So from a society's point of view, these are a threat to the social structure. You can see how that would work. Right? So when a group of young people or a significant segment of a population starts to experiment with these chemicals for altering their consciousness, 
even if they're physiologically safe, they are socially dangerous. And it takes the society only a little while to realize that people are much less controllable when they have had an experience of intuitive validity. They are willing to say, I don't agree. I mean, look what happened to me, for example. I was a professor at Harvard University in a very reputable institution. I had spent my whole life wanting to get there. I was a, and it was a very highly valued position in the United States. And I had the promise of permanent position till I died there. And I could just become old Mr. Chips. Uh, it was lovely. And my pipe, smoke my pipe and do my whole number. And um, then I had these chemicals. And when I had the chemical, I touched a part of myself that made me question the whole social structure and not be willing to play by the rules anymore. Because something was more intuitively valid to me, a part of me that I met was more intuitively valid than the part of me that had been part of the social game. In other words, I met something behind my own ego. And it didn't make me want to throw over Harvard necessarily, but it made me value these inner experiences. And that was so, finally, the use of these chemicals at Harvard was so seductive that pretty soon all the graduate students wanted to explore with these in the psychology department. And um, pretty soon it was all too volatile. And uh, to stop it, um, I was fired from Harvard. In the course of our work there, um, well, I won't tell you all the research, one of the studies was called the Good Friday study, which is an interesting study. It concerns the sacramental use of the chemicals. That um, on Good Friday, 20 theological students from a seminary, a nearby seminary, were divided into two groups. I mean, it, it as a research thing, they didn't know which groups they were in. Half of them were given these, this chemical, this mushroom, in a pill form, psilocybin, and half of them were given a placebo, that is something that made their skin feel funny but didn't affect their consciousness. And then they all were placed in the basement room of the Boston University Chapel where the Friday services were being beamed in through speakers. So these are, these are seminary students who are hearing the Good Friday service, some of whom are on psilocybin and some of whom aren't. It's called a double-blind placebo study. And it was being done by an MD who was taking his PhD at the Harvard School of Divinity. Right? In other words, it was, it was quite an impressive game. It involved three universities. After this experience, all of the seminarians tape recorded what happened to them during that period. Those tapes were then typed. All references to chemicals were taken out. And then the protocols were given to leading theologians around the United States. And they were given a checklist of nine criteria that the Bible puts forth of a religious revelatory experience. Okay? And they were to check whether these protocols reflected any of these nine criteria. Is it clear what I'm telling you, the story? Of the people who had the placebo, one of the ten people had one of the nine experiences. Of the people that had the psilocybin, Nine of them had four or more of the nine criteria of a genuine religious revelatory experience. And the theologians concluded that these nine people, in their estimation, they didn't know it had anything to do with drugs, 
these nine people had had a genuine, in the biblical sense, a genuine religious revelatory experience. They didn't know whether this was a story from Ezekiel or where it was from. They just knew it was a protocol. Now, society had a difficult time dealing with this. In Time magazine, it was called instant mysticism, and it was, it was presented as a, in a facetious, snide way because for the religious institutions to accept the fact that somebody could have a genuine religious revelatory experience, I mean, what, the, what most of the religions are based upon is somebody historically having that, but nobody has them now, and the priests don't have them, and the priest class is merely helping the parishioner keep as a good person because the mystical part of the direct mystical experience has been lost in the, ex in the exoteric religious traditions. So this was quite a threat to the religious establishment. And you can imagine why, because there's a lot of power in the game. And when you shake up, when you shake up social power. So here was one example where the social power led people to have to interpret these experiences as dangerous to the society. And it was generally seen that these phenomena were dangerous to the social structures of the society. And society had to mobilize to stop it. And so what happened was that almost all of these chemicals were outlawed as fast as they appeared. And there were very creative people finding new things. And there was a complete continuous dance of outlaw and new thing and outlaw and new thing. And it went on for still till now. And at the height of it, there were tens of thousands of young people who were turning on. And as Tim Leary used to say, you turn on, you tune in, and then you drop out. You turn on, you tune in to how reality is, and then you decide you don't necessarily want to play the game of the society anymore. And then you figure out how to play in a different way. So out of that came new kinds of social structures, communes, um, bartering systems, uh, whole different social structures were starting to emerge in the 60s. Now, the result of making them illegal were two interesting phenomena. First of all, in the 60s, these chemicals were passed from hand to hand and they were passed along with a great deal of love. And people manufactured them and then sold them at cost and passed them on, being feeling great joy that they were opening people to these experiences. As the illegality started to creep in, then a new group came into the market to manufacture, which was really organized crime, in effect. And it started, as it became anything in a society, when it becomes powerful, it attracts power players who themselves don't want to alter their consciousness. They just want to use this as a way of gaining more power within the social structure. And so it started to change. And the chemicals started to be sold at higher and higher prices, which meant that when you got a chemical, you paid too much for it, which made you paranoid as you got it. And that paranoia started to affect the nature of your experience. Because what we found out was that the, what happens when you take the chemical is a function of the set and the setting. It's a function of the set of your mind. And that's why in the religious rituals, you were prepared so carefully with fasting, with ritual preparation before you had the experience. To just be out at a party and somebody says, here, drink this, that's hardly a ritual preparation. I mean, it is a ritual, but it's not one that that assures that you're going to have a profound and beautiful experience or a religious or mystical experience. And what happened was more and more young people started to use these chemicals not to have a religious revelatory, revelatory experience. They started to use them to enhance their sensory pleasure.